Hello dear Mario, uh, welcome to GAD Foundation, uh, thanks for accepting our interview request. This interview is uh, organized by GAD Foundation and Parametric Architecture uh, magazine. Uh, we invited you to ask a couple of questions around uh, your latest book and your latest theories uh, about the second digital turn. According to your study of the history of architecture, how do you think this computer-aided design has changed the way architects think about the design space building and the relationship between a human and environment? <laughs> That's a one million dollar question, <laughs> which will take one million words to answer. But in short, the first fundamental change is that architecture as we know it or as we knew it, was an act of notation. Architects in the Western, you know, Renaissance tradition do not make buildings. They make drawings of buildings. Notations, which we give to the builders, the builders make the building. We don't cut bricks, we don't lay bricks, we don't cut stones, we don't, we don't just make drawings. The pencil in the humanistic tradition is the tool of our work. We have ideas. With a pencil, we translate these ideas into drawings. These drawings are technical notations. We give them to the builders, the builders make the building. We don't, because we don't do that. We just make drawings. This is the idea of the architect, which was invented in the Renaissance, which was good until a few years ago, until when computers came. And with computers, this separation between design and making is imploded, it doesn't exist anymore, because when you have something on the screen, the same file can be used to produce uh, an image and to produce the, the object itself. The same file on the screen is an image. You put it on a 3D printer or another milling machine and you make the object. So the notation is at that point, the representation and the fabrication at the same time. Whereas traditionally, we are agents of notation, not agents of fabrication. This separation between thinkers and makers. In the Renaissance tradition, we are thinkers, not makers. We think we do not make. The makers make, and they are not allowed to think. But with computers, the same tool is a tool for thinking, for drawing, and for making. And so this separation, which was the foundation of the architectural profession, the reason why we made drawings and not physical objects, does not hold good anymore. Because theoretically, using computational tool, we could and we can notate, represent, and fabricate at the same time. Now, this is the theory. In practice, you can 3D print a teapot, you cannot 3D print a skyscraper. So if you build a big object, you still need all the you know, degrees and layers of technical separation. But with robotics, even these degrees of separation are little by little being reduced. So this is the next step. But anyway, that was the first important thing. We used to be makers of drawing, and now we are makers of notations which can be used immediately and directly for physical fabrication. This is what computers do. Well, computers did. Computers today are increasingly tools of artificial intelligence. And so that's another story, because they can solve problem of decision making, which traditionally we kept for ourselves but increasingly they can be devolved to an artificial intelligence, which is increasingly capable of making reasonable, informed decision in our stead when we delegate. So phase one, inherent to architectural profession, the end of the separation between design and making. Phase two, with the rise of artificial intelligence, but this is not just for the architectural profession, for every human activity. Increasingly, the machines are no longer tools for making. They're becoming increasingly tools for thinking. Yes. So, but this is not going to happen overnight.
Yeah, it's just, you know, yeah, that's a trend. That's a trend. Of course. In your new book, you have talked about the second digital turn and the voxelation or voxelization style in design. How would you define these terms? Yes, in a simple word. Yes, voxelation, voxelization. We could even call it discretism, the style of discretization. So the idea that many little bits and pieces, chunks, peaks of voxel, whatever, they are notated, calculated, and fabricated individually, and they show as units. So you can see all the little chunks which compose the physical object. In, to some extent, this is a consequence of the shift in the use of the tools for um, uh, computer-aided um, fabrication. Because in the 90s, the driving, the most common machine for uh, computer-aided um, making or manufacturing was a CNC milling machine, which was a milling machine which carves wood and takes away subtractive technology, taking matter out. And they did it mostly by following smooth lines, which created the spliny, smooth style of the 90s, which we still call parametricism. Now, with the rise of 3D printing, a 3D printer print each, meaning shifting from subtractive to additive technologies. Instead of taking matter out, matter is fabricated, almost out of nothing, almost out of thin air. But it is printed out by little chunks. These chunks are called voxels. The way the machine works, it makes a voxel, and then another, and then another. Each voxel is in individually fabricated. Now, you could theoretically merge all the voxels you need in a single smooth uniform surface. You could do it, it's possible. But as it always and or often happens, the logic of the tool fits back onto the mentality of the operator. And so if you are using a machine that makes everything by little discrete piece, you may want at some point to show the technical logic you're using in the object you're making. And so since the machine, by its own technical logic and nature, makes everything by little chunks, at some point it becomes reasonable and logic to show the chunks. And, show, and so the discrete logic of manufacturing becomes an aesthetic attribute. Because instead of hiding it, you actually display it. And so increasingly, if you use machine for almost artificial intelligence, uh, you know, if there is a piece of something which is made of four gazillion voxels, meaning a big number of yeah, voxels, of yeah. If we had to work that way, we couldn't because as humans, we cannot, well, we could, but it would take forever. It's not notate, practical. Notate, calculate, and fabricate four gazillion voxels one by one. It's not a practical proposal because you start today, you will never end. But a machine can notate, calculate, and fabricate four trillion voxels in 10 minutes. And so this logic of discrete components, which we humans would never use because it would take too long, for machines, it is quite usable because machines can, in fact, machines are very good at computers, are making very simple operations very many times. It's what they do. Arithmetic, but at hyper super fast speed. And so the idea, we could in a, you know, in a game, for a practical joke, calculate a box which is made of 27 voxels. It's possible. It's a, you know, a child's game. But if we want to make a building which is made of, or an object, which is even a tip, which is made of four gazillion voxels, it's, we couldn't do it. Computers can do it. So this is a shift between our way of thinking, our way of making, and the way computers think and make. We tend to simplify objects to make them understandable for our you know, limited capa capacity of arithmetical calculations. Yes. <laughs> computers don't have those limits because they are dumb, but they are very fast. And so they can show the logic. Well, they can produce pieces of solid matter which are made of a huge, well, call it excessive resolution, a huge degree of resolution. It's not excessive for them. It's excessive for us because we cannot count those voxels. Computers can. And so this shows it's a style, it's an aesthetic, but in engineering, it is a big change because if you think what a structural engineer typically does, there are limits 
of, to the degree of resolution to which we can push our calculation of a physical object. Think of a beam in reinforced concrete. We simplify it. We do not micro-design each little, each little chunk of it. We could, but it would take forever. Computer can, to the limit, push the resolution of this structural object to an almost microscopic level of resolution. And they can calculate and, in fact, fabricate a beam, a structural piece, where each microscopic component is different from all others. Which means, you know, in a beam of reinforced concrete, we admit that concrete is the same all over. Even in fact it isn't, but we have to assume, for calculating it, that concrete is the same all over. And the steel, um, um, the iron, the steel, how do you call it, beam, mm -hmm. um, rod, it's the steel rod. It is in fact always the same, except we tweak it, so we can take into account that here it is a 45 degree, here it is, so we can admit of small variation in the steel rod, which is merged inside the, this is as far as we can go. Beyond that, it becomes too complicated for our traditional computational instrument because we have to calculate yes. everything by hand. Whereas using computational intelligence and 3D printing, you can print out a beam where each voxel is different from all others. Not accidentally, but by design. And so you can calculate this voxel here to be stronger than the voxel next to it. And the one next to it, perhaps you don't need a voxel there. You leave it empty. And so you can mass customize the structural component to a microscopic level of resolution. So instead of designing the structure, paradoxically, you could imagine that the structure is always the same. You design what happens inside the structure, which is what typically we couldn't do. So for engineering, this is a big change because you can design at a level of granularity, which would allow a degree of precision in the calculation, which means saving a lot of building materials, for example, because where the material is not needed, you will not use it. Whereas traditionally, we could never, even if we could calculate it, we could not notate it in a way which was precise enough for an artisan or even you know, a fabricator to execute it. Because you cannot expect a um, master builder to build a beam with the precision of a surgeon or a dentist. If we were so precise, it would be a dentist, not a master mason. <laughs> but today with 3D printing, we can print a beam with a degree of resolution with which a dentist would have printed a dental implant. Huh. Yes. This can save a lot of, well, work. Work and material resources. You know, steel yes. is expensive. Shouldn't waste it. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> What is the need of architecture today to use big data and voxelation style in design? For what kind of architecture problems is this method a solution? For all the problems to which it provides solutions. There are problems to which it doesn't provide any solution and then you shouldn't even try. Um, but with today's architecture styles, uh, I think, uh, I don't know, maybe using this kind of ornaments or uh, very too much detail. Is there any need for that? Exactly, exactly. Um, these are all tools of mass customization, the possibility to micro-design variations at no additional cost. But the question is, do we need that? Or when do we need it? For example, using these technologies, uh, you could imagine that you know, this glass is probably cheap because it is made somewhere with a mold where the same mold is used to reproduce one billion identical glasses. Standardization, mass production, economies of scale. The more identical glasses you make, the cheaper each glass will be. That's the logic of the Industrial Revolution. Using computational tools, you could, theoretically, in practice we are not yet there, but in theory, you could make one million of these glasses, all different from every other one, one million, all different at the same unit cost. So variations would not entail any supplemental cost. It's possible. Assuming it's possible, the question is, why on earth would you need one million different glasses? If this glass is good, it's good for me, as it is good for you, as it is good for everyone else. Probably we don't need to make one gazillion different 
glasses. Um, one of the founder of um, inventor of the digital tool in the 90s, Bernard Cash, as an example, he always lectured with a big pen, a plastic big pen in his hand, a great product of French consumer design. And his argument is, I, use, I could use a 3D printer to make this big pen customized specifically for me, and you could do a different one specifically for you, and each one would mass, could mass customize a big ballpoint pen specific to her or him. But why would we need to do it since this big pen is perfect and it works just fine for every user on earth? So there are cases when mass customization isn't, doesn't solve any problem. There are cases where it solves big problems because there are cases where one size does not fit all. Oh, A nice. big pen, it's one size which fits more or less everyone. But for example, if you need a dental implant, Probably one I need is different from the one you need. Assuming yeah, it's like fingerprint. Everyone yeah, is different yeah, from yeah, each yeah. other. Oh, but surgery. It's some, some of these technologies were developed for surgical implants before they were used at the scale of you know, engineering. Because if you need a knee replacement or a hip replacement, it has to be custom made. And so using 3D scanning and 3D printing, you can customize it more precisely and cheaper than using traditional mechanical tools. The same for dentistry. Of course, they have more money than we do in the building and construction industry, because a knee replacement is more expensive than, you know, a piece of reinforced concrete. But yeah, thank you. <laughs> How much second digital turn and voxelation style will change the future of architecture for better? I'm not certain that they can. But it's one of the tools that we have at our disposal. We must try to use them because there are. There is evidence that they solve some problems. They will not solve every problem, but these tools are out there. Why should we not try to make something out of them? I, I'm certain that many architectural problems are completely irrelevant to computation, and computation is completely irrelevant to many architectural questions. As we were saying yesterday in the conference, in the lecture, some architectural problems are computable, then computers can help. Some are non-computable, and then computers cannot help. But where quantification is part of the game, computers are a big help, because they help to optimize the solution. Hence, to save time, money, resources, renewable material, minimize energy waste, et cetera, et cetera. All things we care about. Thank you. But of course, architecture is way more than that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Due to te technological and cultural changes and the expansion of the tools for design, what do you see as the role of architects in future? Could AI be the future architect? No, no. It's not going to happen anywhere, anytime soon. So this is a debate between <laughs> the designers and architects. It's, it's going to design for us what, what, what it's going to do, AI, what is AI? Well, we don't know what is AI. For the time being, it's a tool we use, but it is not a tool that is going to replace us for many reasons, but basically AI is a problem solving device. It is good for solving a problem of a certain degree of complexity. Architecture is such a complex problem. Each architectural project has levels of complexity that we cannot quantify because we cannot even rationalize. For better, for worse, and I don't say it is good, but it is inevitable. Much of what happens in the decision-making process of an architectural design is based on intuition, feeling, taste, ideology, personal choices, uh, idiosyncratic opinions. It's not something that you can prove, as in a mathematical demonstration. And in that area of subjectivity, computational tools are perfectly irrelevant. Then, as we said, there are many areas of pure technical you know, quantification where computers are a big help. But again, we shouldn't confuse instrument and intentions. Computers are instruments. They are help to implementing our intentions. But intentionality is ours. Instrumentality is theirs. They are instrument in the service of our intentions. But they don't provide intentions. Intentions are ours. We have intentions. Computers are instrument. Intentionality is us. Instrumentality is them. 
Yes. Then so I have a second argument why I don't think that artificial intelligence is going to be a problem for us anytime soon. Artificial intelligence is still so expensive, and architectural labor is still so cheap, but it doesn't make any sense to use an expensive machine to replace cheap human labor. Yes, so, <laughs> so you say, you say <laughs> ro robots are not going to kill us. <laughs> because robots future. are more expensive than architects. Yeah. <laughs> for the time being, well, I robots are going to replace expensive profession. Profession with a huge amount of added value. Yes. And so economic logic, if there is a surgeon whose work is paid $1 million per hour, there is an incentive to replace it with a good computer or a good robotic hand. You know how much architectural labor yes. costs? $15 per hour? So there is no incentive to replace yes. any of us oh, with a computer which is going to be way more expensive than we are. So don't worry, <laughs> it's not going to happen. We are too cheap. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I don't worry, I don't worry. Yeah. It's an we instrument we should learn to use yeah. because it solves yeah. many problems. Yeah, but it's already a tool. Yeah, it's a tool, instrument. Yeah. Instruments is there, intentions is here. In your guess or predictions, who are the next generation of architects who will dive into this world and become star architects? In other words, who is the next Frank Gehry of late 90s? I hope no one becomes a star architect. In this field? No, 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 I don't like star architects. I mean, architects is a, architecture is a good profession. When you do a good job, you don't need to become a star architect. There will be good architects, there will be bad architects, and there will be architects in between. The stardom of the architectural profession, in my opinion, is an accident of history. It happened at a precise point in time. I do not know why it happened, particularly around the turn of the millennium. I mean, Le Corbusier was a famous architect, but he didn't have in the 30s, nor in the 60s, the level of stardom that some of our friends have today. Uh, never happened before. It's unprecedented. So, in my opinion, it's a quirk. It won't, yes. it won't last. I mean, a good architect will have a good reputation. Le Corbusier How lived a good it? life. People invited him around the world and he traveled first class. And he made some money, particularly in the second part of his life. That's okay. You don't need to be, a st well, he was a star architect at a human scale. That's what I say. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Without exaggeration. <laughs> yes. <laughs> True. Mies was a star architect. He made a decent life of, you know, a successful professional. Yeah. Thanks for your time. In closing, may I ask, what advice would you like to share with young architects? Um, to do a lot of work, and particularly to devote a lot of work to the systematic learning in classroom of topics which you do not learn in a studio. Because what I see is many of our students and colleagues, the studio is becoming the only pedagogical site for the training of the architect. Everything else is ornament. That was the Beaux-Arts system, the system of the School of Fine Arts, which was eliminated in the 20th century because it proved its ineffectiveness. We shouldn't go back to that because it already failed. The 20th century great invention was the School of Architecture where the architect is trained in different formats. One is studio-based, one is classroom-based, and one is lab-based. We must train as designer in a studio, as scholar in a classroom, as scientist in a lab. We need these three pillars to be well-trained. Only one is not enough. That's my, my ideal school has these three pillars, the studio, the classroom, and the lab. The studio for designing and making creative stuff. The classroom for learning boring stuff. And the, stu and the lab for making daring experiments. We need these three formats. We work on these three modes. Only one, it may be good for some star architect, but for most of us, it will not work. We need all yeah. three. But uh, about today's uh, uh, architecture programs in universities, do you have any comments? or? Is it working or not, except Bartlett or AA? Do you think it is true, uh, they are on the wrong way or on the right way? Because we have a lot of graduated architects now and they're complaining there's no work, there's no. Do you think it's because of architecture programs in universities? Is there any problem? 
number of jobs that are available to architects does not depend on the number of architects we train in the School of Architecture. Real estate booms and busts all the time, and we are at the mercy of the fluctuation of the markets. There are times when there are not enough architects on the market, and times where you know, newly graduated architects know that for five years there will be no jobs. When I came onto the market myself, there were no jobs. <laughs> but <laughs> things, yes. things change. No, we, cannot, we cannot do much about that. Concerning the level of training we provide in schools, yes, there are different models, there are different approaches. Some are more successful, some, including the example I just provided, are, in my opinion, doomed because they do not train professionals which are apt to compete on an international marketplace. Um, so there are winners and losers. There are some schools that are winning and some schools that are losing. I'm not going to make any names, but don't think that some of the big names are the winners. Some yes. of the big names I'm thinking of are actually the losers. the losers. And some little schools, which have no star reputation, are doing excellent training. So not everything that looks like gold is gold, something like that. It's an Italian problem. We have so don't be misled by the shimmering, shining yes. appearances. Do you, Mario, thanks for your time. And we do really appreciate GAD Foundation for sponsoring and organizing this interview. Thanks. Thank you.